Well, welcome everyone to the final lecture of the Diaconate Program for Vespers, Orthros, and Divine Liturgy for 2021. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Let's begin with a prayer. Lord our God, save your people and bless your inheritance. Protect the fullness of your church, sanctify those who love the beauty of your house, glorify them in return by your divine power, and forsake us not who have set our hope in you. For yours is the dominion, and yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and forever, and unto the ages of ages. That prayer was taken from the Divine Liturgy, and today our theme is the Divine Liturgy, and we're going to try to go through all of the Divine Liturgy, um, emphasizing especially the um, role of the deacon. So before we do this, um, let me just uh, give you a little outline of the Divine Liturgy and the main parts to kind of like give us a map so we can know where we are, and we're going to try to uh, go through each of these units and uh, understand them in great detail. But first, let's have a general overview. Here I have a general outline, and of course, the Divine Liturgy is divided into two main parts. As you know, the so-called Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Faithful, so Roman numeral Number one is this big main um, major part of the divine liturgy, part one, you might say, and then Roman numeral no Roman numeral number two is the second part two, the liturgy of the faithful. Basically, we have two things going on here. The first part is based on the synagogue worship, you might say. It's a continuation. It's kind of like that continuity, whereas the second part is that radical newness, in other words, that thing that is basically unique to Christianity, that is to say, that has that is connected with the Incarnation, the Eucharist, Holy Communion, Body of Christ, that is the perfect God and perfect man, and we become part of that in the Divine Liturgy, and thus we actually have a foretaste of the final consummation of this marriage of heaven and earth, the Kingdom of God, here and now, in the Holy Spirit, in the Divine Liturgy. So, the first part, obviously, Liturgy of the Word, is concentrating on the Word. So we have two main manifestations of Christ here. What we have is, the first manifestation is the manifestation of Christ in His Word. In other words, in the Word of God, in Scripture. So the main sort of um, concentration for the Liturgy of the Word is obviously the Word, the Word of God, Scripture. So the reading of Scriptures and the Sermon, that's really the basic um, uh, structure or the kernel, you might say, of the liturgy of the word, also called the pro anaphora, in other words, the before the anaphora. The anaphora being basic, the, the basic element of the liturgy of the faithful. So, the first, so we have two manifestations of Christ, and we see that even the architecture of the early churches um, emphasized these two manifestations of Christ, these two um, indications of. Uh, Christ in our midst, the reality of Christ in our midst, in the midst of the people. And that, therefore, physically, in the church, in the middle of the church, there was a so-called ambon that we talked about where the scripture readings would be read from. The deacons would read the um, gospel from that ambon, which was a thing we'll see, we'll see some um, pictures of the ambon uh, later on. Basically, a, an apparatus with a stair with a staircase going up to a pedestal, and then another staircase going down, um, and the the readings would be done from the top of this uh, amvon, now called a pulpit, which has shrunk and has gone off to the side. So it used to be in the middle, which means it emphasized the presence of Christ in His Word in the midst of the people, physically, in the middle of the church. Okay, so and then. For the part two, for the liturgy of the faithful, that is to say, and obviously the main part of that is the so-called anaphora or the Eucharistic prayer. Um, we have the manifestation of Christ in our midst in the sacrament. So we have word, manifestation of Christ in the word, and then manifestation of Christ in the sacrament, in the Eucharist. And again, the... the place where that would occur would be the altar table. So Ambon for the liturgy of the word, that's a sort of central ecclesial furniture, you might say, whereas for the 
the liturgy of the faithful, the central sort of uh, ecclesia ecclesial furniture would be the altar table. And that also was in a central position. So it's not, it wasn't so pushed back the way it is now. So there's a whole uh, evolution and de development of church architecture, but I'm just emphasizing that the early church ac architecture had the altar table sort of jutting out in a way that sort of, and also the tembalon or iconostas was not basically covering all that. In other words, it was a low parapet wall. And so all these things were accessible. So the sense in which both the ambon in the, cent in the center of the nave and also the uh, altar table jutting out into the nave, okay, um, basically I emphasized, both of these emphasized these two great manifestations of Christ. Okay, so do not waste too much time because there's a, so much that we have to look at. Let me just say the following. Uh, the anarchsis is the so-called beginning when the priest says, many, blessed is the kingdom of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and the ages of ages. Okay. And then the three antiphons, I have them in, in italics because they actually were tacked on or, um, in a, at a later date. They originally were, as we said before, part of the so-called stational liturgy. And so the actual beginning of the liturgy in the time of St. Chrysostom, let's say, would be the entrance of all the people, right, into the church. Um, and then the readings, sermon, and then the petitions. In other words, allowing God to speak through his word, the manifestation of God in his word, and then we speak back and ask for things that we need and so on and so forth. Okay, so we basically first glorify God and then we ask for stuff, you might say. Okay, so I have the Trisayan in italics too, because that also was tacked on at, at a later date. The, the, the three antiphons uh, around the ninth century, um, and then the Trisayan um, a, a little after that, uh, as a space filler, you might say, for the people to enter. Okay, so th those are the basic elements of part one, Liturgy of the Word, and then Liturgy of the Faithful obviously has the great entrance where, you know, the things that are needed are brought in by the deacons. Originally, the great entrance was done only by the deacons and it was done silently, but eventually um, there's a rule that Robert Taft, Father Robert Taft, the famous liturgist, um, stresses and emphasizes that um, there are soft areas, soft areas in the liturgy. Wherever there's a point in the liturgy where there's an action without words, eventually it's gonna get filled up with, um, uh, liturgical words and 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 um, intonations and uh, it, it'll get elaborate so the great entrance was basically an intermission it's kind of like the changing of the guards and so it was a soft kind of like part of the liturgy but it ended up becoming very magnificent anyway great entrance and the so-called pre anaphoral rites that's referring to that's the way Robert Taft uh, refers to the things leading up to the anaphora. Okay, so we have all these things. We might as well not uh, waste time looking at all of them, but uh, after the great entrance, there's a completion litany, strangely enough. It really belongs to the, the end of these petitions. That was the end of the sort of liturgy of the word, but it ended up getting in the books here and it got stuck. Story for another day. Kiss of peace, the creed, and then we get into the anaphora. So, great entrance, anaphora, the central sort of Eucharistic uh, prayer uh, where you have the consecration of the gifts. Okay, and it begins with a dialogue with the people. Of course, the deacon is the one who begins the dialogue by calling everyone to the to attention. Stomen kalos, stomen metaphovu, stand upright and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, okay. words of institution, we'll talk about them. The consecration, so-called epiclesis, okay. Uh, the diptychs, that is to say, that is the end of the anaphora. The diptychs are referring to names of um, living and dead, beginning with uh, the Panagia, and then all the saints, and then our living and dead, and so on and so forth, and ending being sealed with the commemoration, commemoration of the bishop. Remember we said that you cannot have a liturgy without commemorating your bishop, because that local bishop is the one who, in, for, in virtue of the permission given by him, we are allowed to do the liturgy. Okay, so that emphasizes the old unity around the bishop, istipon ketopon Christu, as a type of Christ, as it were, an icon of Christ, okay? Uh, Pre-communion, things going on right before the communion, a petition acknowledging 
that we've commemorated all the saints and also that we've sanctified the gifts, fine. The actual communion, beginning with the so-called fraction, we're going to look at that, dividing the, the lamb into four pieces. Why? Because Christ also divided the bread, breaking of the bread, but also for practical reasons that we'll, we, can, might be, we might have time to, to speak about. Um, and then communion, and then the so-called concluding rites, that is to say, rites leading up to the, the dismissal. Um, we have the final litany of thanksgiving, arise, and the deacon again, of course, arise, having partaken of the holy gifts and so on and so forth, let us worthily give thanks to the Lord, okay, giving thanks to the Lord, and then the dismissals, because as I said in the, the video on the pre-sanctified, we, we end up having today four dismissals because we never want liturgy to end, and how are we going to allow this class to end? I don't know how. It's like life. You don't want it to end anyway. It, it's going to have to end, and today is the last day, and I'm going to try to go through this quickly so you can finally conclude this class. Um, okay. Okay, so we begin with the first part of liturgy right after the Anarchies, the very beginning when the priest begins the divine liturgy. Uh, we have the three antiphons, and we said that those antiphons are actually coming, they're attacked on later on, and the original beginning of the Divine Liturgy was a small entrance, but these eventually were tacked on around the 8th or 9th century, and uh, the way they're composed, the way they're structured is basically we have a petition first, a petition, and then a, a series of hymns, okay? So the first antiphon is the Great Litany, and then uh, the Tes Pres Vies de Theotoku, through the prayers of, our, of the Theotokos with verses in between. Um, and the Great Litany is basically composed of about 12 petitions. Sometimes you have more, sometimes less, but usually it's um, these four triads. The first three are talking about peace, and that's why it's called the Litany of Peace, peace and things. Uh, the second three are talking about or referring to people, and such as the bishop, the king, and so on and so forth, whoever. Uh, the third set of three are talking about um, our special petitions, talking about the, the community, uh, weather, the weather, travelers. And then the last three are uh, basically more fervent petitions, you might say, talking about people who are have in, in necessity and uh, affliction and so on and so forth. And then it ends with, it's sealed with the Theotokos. Anyway, um, the first deacon, if you have more than one deacon, the first deacon will do the great litany and the second de deacon will do the second and third, the litanies from the second and third um, uh, uh, antiphons. And one of the perennial questions is where does the deacon um, sort of wait in between when the, when the hymns are being chanted? And there are different traditions, but it seems that, um, you know, you either do antiphons or uh, the typica, which we talked about the typica last time. Uh, and it seems that according to the rubrics, if you're doing the typica after the first, um, peti the first, Petition for the, the, the after the petitions for the great litany, in other words, for the first antiphon, you wait in front of the icon of Christ, and then for the for the second antiphon, referring to, uh, you you wait in front of the icon of the Panagia. Or to do the antiphons at, uh, after the first uh, after the great litany uh, during the hymns for the first antiphon, you would be in front of the uh, Panagia. And then for the second antiphon, we would be in front of the icon of uh, Christ. Let's look at a deacon doing the great litany uh, at a hierarchical liturgy. In other words, when there's a bishop. <laughs> It's the very end of the Great Litany. You see that all the clergy are aligned on either side of the bishop at the throne. So this is specific to a hierarchical liturgy. Obviously, if there was not a bishop, you would, this, would not be, this would not be done this way. Just the deacon would be outside doing the petitions. Ο 
ότι πρέπει σύντομα τιμή και προσκύνηση. Το πατρί και το ιό και το αγίο πνεύμα τη νύχια αή και ει του αιώνα των αιώνων. And in a hierarchical liturgy, the deacon then returns back to his position. The first deacon uh, on the right of the bishop always. Πάντα τα έθνη κρατήσατε χείρα του with the second priest. And the second priest enters to do the ekphonesis, and the second deacon will do the uh, second antiphon petitions and the third antiphon petitions. And both of them are small litanies. So we begin with the great litany, first deacon, and then second and third uh, antiphon litanies, uh, the second deacon. <laughs> they enter at the uh, second antiphon. Ο 
Ότι αγαθός και φιλάνθρωπος Θεός υπάρχεις και εσύ την δόξα να αναπέμπομαι το Πατρί και το Υιό και το Αγίο Πνεύμα Την νυν και αή και εις τους αιώνας των αιώνων Now, now let's go to Athens and uh, observe the third antiphon and the bishop descending. In other words, preparation for the small entrance, that is to say, the actual real beginning of the divine liturgy. <laughs> Το πατρί και το ιό και το αγίο πνεύμα την ίδια ή και ει του αιώνα των αιώνων. Άλλο small entrance. Άκουσον φύγατε και είδε. Άκουσον φύγατε και είδε. Άκουσον φύγατε και είδε. Άκουσον φύγατε και είδε. Sense. This is the real beginning of the Divine Liturgy because the bishop is the president of the Eucharistic Assembly. So the, the liturgy actually starts with him. So when he gets into the action, that is an indication that this is the actual beginning of the Divine Liturgy. look at the small entrance at Holy Cross Chapel. Recently there was an ordination in our chapel. Um, I believe it was last Saturday. Um, 
the chaplain who was a priest, he uh, was elevated, he was ordained a bishop. And so we had a whole bunch of bishops and also Archbishop Elpidoforo. So let's see how the small entrance is done when you have a whole bunch of uh, bishops. Again, this is the point in the liturgy when the bishop actually gets, begins to be active, okay? Blessed are you, so you see, what we have here is uh, the second deacon. So this actually, this deacon is um, John Chrysavgis, who wrote the book, The Agonia, that you probably had to read at some point. Um, he really is a the archdeacon for the patriarchate, but for some reason they have him as the second deacon in this liturgy. In any case, you see um, the sort of order of the small entrance. We have the first deacon obviously going to be holding the gospel, and the second deacon will be, in this case, holding the uh, uh, three keri and the keri. In other words, the the two um, candle holders, the one with the three and one with the two. And of course, that originally the purpose of those um, candles was just simply light because they needed it uh, because they didn't have electricity in those days. But later on, the symbolism of three, Holy Trinity, and two, the two natures of Christ, the divine nature and the human nature. And this kind of structure, when you have a whole bunch of bishops, they kind of like make a semicircle with the main bishop over there. And this is harkens back to um, the Syrian synthronon. In other words, it would be uh, this kind of a shape facing east. Second deacon with the, the carry and the carry, the first deacon with the gospel, and then the priests according to rank. And I'm going to show you a picture of this that will help you understand. And the first deacon obviously goes first to the archbishop, bows to him, and then once he once he does the blesses the entrance. Then the, the first deacon, the archdeacon, goes to the front and does the Sophia or the, which again is a call to attention. Wisdom. Let us be attentive. Let us stand up. And then everyone together chants the um, entrance hymn. And the entrance hymn changes according to the season, according to the main feast being um, celebrated. Actually, Strangely enough, Pentecost has not happened yet, but this uh, liturgy, which is a liturgy that within which a, an ordination is occurring, uh, for some reason, they, uh, it was an exact copy of Pentecost. That's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, in any case, uh, each feast would have its own sort of entrance hymn that everyone would chant together. <laughs> Let me explain a few things about rank, where everyone belongs, and this will show you how, how important the role of the deacon is. Okay, here we have a diagram that shows you that the deacon, in a sense, is the peak. It's almost like a mountain. So this is a diagram of uh, a small entrance, okay? The so-called small entrance in the divine liturgy. And on purpose, I drew the uh, people with different heights in order to show you in a sense, who is the most important? What do I mean by this? Why am I saying that the, the archdeacon is the most important? Because from him going front, going forward, everyone recedes. In other words, we have the first deacon, second deacon, and maybe could have been a third deacon or an altar boy here. Whereas behind him, the priests recede, first, second. So it would be first deacon, and then from him, second, third, fourth, fifth. First deacon, and behind them, priest, first, second, third, fourth. So in a sense, he's the peak. So I have it as a sort of mountain here, okay? If it were to be, if it were a um, hierarchical liturgy, it's possible that it could have been like this. And of course, you're going to see different versions. But again, you see this mountain, right? The archdeacon being the sort of peak, and everyone recedes in front of him, and everyone recedes in back of him. And how does rank work? Well, according to age of ordination, not 
uh, biological age, but how long you've been ordained. Okay, so the longer you've been or ordained, then you, the, you, the, the further up your position, as it were. Okay, so in this case, if it's a hierarchical liturgy where you have a vicari and tricari, the way it works, the, this is the first deacon, this is the second deacon, and the second deacon is the next in rank, so he gets to hold the tricari, which is the more important one, and then the third deacon holds the vicari. But the first deacon, always in a small entrance, is going to be holding the uh, gospel, and then behind him, the priests. But in this one, I want to show you that according to the rubrics that we find in the Simonopatra uh, Iraticon or Liturgicon, it says that the first deacon holds the gospel and the second deacon will hold the cross in the small uh, entrance. And then, oh, that's... Now let's go back to Holy Cross and see how everyone enters into the um, sanctuary after the small entrance. So you see how it works? Uh, everyone is going to go according to rank, uh, right, left, right, left, right, left, uh, with the first, well, the first is the bishop, the archbishop, being the sort of center point, right? So from him, right, left, right, left, that's the rank of these bishops who also, they are ranked by age, as it were, of ordination. And then when you have a whole bunch of bishops and a whole bunch of priests, then it's kind of like concentric, kind of like almost like concentric, not really circles, but concentric kind of like lines, where behind them, you're gonna have, again, the priests according to rank, the one that's closest and to the right of the archbishop is gonna be the first priest, okay? So first, second, third, fourth so it's always right left right left right left and then everyone enters then something that's particular to a liturgy with a hierarchical liturgy a liturgy with a bishop is the fact that the bishop after the entrance will sense. So priests are not supposed to do this. So when you see a priest doing this, it's wrong. They're imitating or appropriating the role of the bishop. So the bishop, why would they sense the bishop? Because again, we said that the actual beginning of services, the preparation for the service would be a sort of sanctification of the space. And that would, what all, the beginning of each service, we remember we mentioned this in Orthros and also in Vespers, would be a sensing. So kind of like sanctify the area and also um, you know, sense all the icons and all the people who are the living icons of God. So this technically we remember in a, you know, a, a hierarchical liturgy that the, this is the actual beginning of the divine liturgy. And that's why this is retained in the case of a hierarchical liturgy. And what's important is we see how the deacons in this sensing are always going to be opposite the bishop. And the way they go is it's going to be, um, the first deacon is going to be, he's going to have the second deacon to his left. Why? Because they're going to be um, going around, and when they end up outside, the first deacon ends up, if he has his, he, if he has the second deacon to his left, that means that he's going to be on the right side of the church when he's facing east. And that's important because that's his side, because that's the better side, as it were, right? Byzantines always have it like this, right is right, the symbolism of the right hand of God, and so on and so forth. When you do a double sensing, the first deacon will sense the right half of the church. In other words, when we say right half, we mean when you're facing east, uh, what's to your right is considered the right half of the church, where the more important people are, let's say. So, according to the, today's uh, rubrics, uh, after the third antiphon and then the, the small entrance entering back into the sanctuary, uh, the uh, apolitikia and other troparia and the kondakion are uh, chanted. And the when you have more than one priest or more than one bishop, like in this case, it's a so-called silitrugon, uh, the rule is that the clergy altogether chant the first, that is to say the, the Apolitikion of the feast, and the last of this series of uh, troparia. And the last is the so-called kondakion.
can see how the first stick and the one holding the spaghetti is on the right side of the church when you're looking east and right. Everything works. And you see the synchron on the back, right? Archbishop does the normal great sensor that you know also. Starting with the bishop's throne and then right, left, right, left, right, left. Okay, great. And next is the Trisagion. And then the second deacon debates the Amen. And the reason for this is because this is a call to attention that it is, a, it is time to do the Trisagion. And you notice the distribution of labor. The first deacon did the first to of the Ithomen, and the second deacon did enter the ages of ages. Oh, and then the Thusagion, when you have a bishop, there's going to be rather than three, it's going to be five. And the way it works is in a hierarchical liturgy, and also in a liturgy when you have more than one priest, according to the Greek typical one at least, uh, you have five, and the way it works is the first one is done by the choir, right choir, second left choir, third clergy, fourth uh, choir again, and then the fifth by the clergy. <laughs>
cross and he gave me a two leg first deacon in Greece they oftentimes just put it on the holy table the ticket to the left and the ticket to the right And this special extra set of uh, the Trisagion called Tuvimatos that occurs only when you have a bishop uh, harkens back to the time when the Trisagion was actually an entrance hymn and it got tacked onto the divine liturgy before the readings in today's practice. But in the olden days, as people were walking into the liturgy, uh, into the, the church, uh, they would be chanting verses from uh, Psalm 79. And a memory of this is the fact that the bishop, uh, he goes out and blesses the people as he uh, chants uh, verses um, 15 and 16 from Psalm 20, 79, which is, look down from heaven and behold and visit this vineyard which your right hand planted and perfected. So again, uh, older forms show up when you have a bishop because you don't have a bishop every day, so it gets less wear and tear, and these things are sort of preserved. So it's very interesting. Let's watch it. And the deacons go out, as you see. Verse 15 from Psalm 79, hearkening back to the old practice, when this was a processional hymn, with verses of Psalm 79 and then the refrain, I hear so theos, that everyone could repeat, because it was easy. And then after the two vimatos, the, the clergy go back to the old synthronon. And let me show you a picture of the synthronon the way it used to look. This is an example of a synthronon from the um, a seventh century synthronon from uh, an island near Venice. So you see how this is the highest throne and what is emphasized is this idea of, of the liturgy as an icon of the kingdom where you have Christ in the middle because the, the um, bishop is serves as an icon of Christ, which means a participation in that reality or a communication of um, the personal presence of Christ, just like icons um, using um, wood and paint uh, communicate the true presence of the um, Christ of the end times. Uh, in the divine liturgy, uh, we weak people, as weak or weaker than wood and paint, are being borrowed in order to communicate that reality. Another synthron. Synthronon, here's on the island of Paros, and another one. And then in the liturgy that we're looking at, let's see in modern times how that's done. Uh, the synthronon the are not as magnificent as they used to be, but still some bishops do do this practice where at this point they would all go to the back of the apse, in other words, uh, to have this imagery of the synthronon. Dinamis, you're going to see that there's going to be a dialogue between the uh, deacons and the main celebrant, and then they're all going to go back to the synthron. Dialogue. And then the blessing of the 
high throne and they go back to that throne which is referring to the ancient throne of the sinful one. So you see this imagery of the bishop in the middle and then everyone else on either side. And again, everyone according to rank, right, left, right, left of the main celebrant. Here we are back in Athens with Archbishop Christodoulos at the Dinamis and going back to the Synthron, you see him in the middle. And we have these series of uh, commands given by the deacons in a hierarchical liturgy. And the first one is Kyrios Soson Tusevsevis, but what does that mean? save the pious people? What, the impious people are not gonna get saved? Well, it's basically uh, can be seen as a development, a later development, even a distortion of the original idea because the original words don't make sense anymore. The original words were Kyrie soson tus facilis, Lord save the kings, Lave, Lord save the emperor. So now that there's no more emperor because the Byzantine empire has fallen, it doesn't mean anything. So it, it, Vasilis, were, was re replaced with Fsevis, so Lord save the whole, the um, pious people. And this is done twice, or actually three times. And then uh, the third time, what is uh, recited by the deacons is Ke um, Pacus uh, and and hear us. <laughs> of the bishops. So in the case of the Church of Greece, obviously it's gonna be the Archbishop of Greece, whereas in other places under the Patriarchate, like uh, the United States, uh, the first Femi is gonna be for the Patriarch, and then the second one is gonna be for uh, the Archbishop. However, uh, the practice of the Archbishop, ever since we have Elpidophorus as the Archbishop, is uh, the older practice of having the Femi for the Patriarch be enchanted three times. Let's hear the Femi for the Patriarch from Holy, Clor Holy Cross Chapel. Bartholomeo to Panagio Tag, Kumeniku Patriarch, Ola Taeti.
they do it three times now under Elpidophorus. And now the Femi of the Archbishop. Now we're technically at the real beginning of the divine liturgy. In other words, the entrance and then the readings immediately. That's the way it used to be. But then these things got in the way, it got in the middle, as it were. And the way the readings work is first we have the epistle reading, obviously, and then normally there would be the Alleluia. In other words, a whole bunch of Alleluias in between. And that would give time for the great sensing, basically the sensing of the gospel to prepare the gospel in the same way that we prepare the whole space for the divine liturgy. We show respect to the gospel by sensing it, just like we, we sense people uh, as icons of God. We show respect to them. We show respect to the icons. And the gospel is also a primary icon, as we said before, of the uh, real pr of the presence of Christ in our midst uh, through his word. So um, normally the sensing would not be done while the uh, epistle is being read. That's rude. How could that possibly be? If even the clergy are not paid, paying attention to the epistle being read, what kind of an example is that? That means that the, the, the people certainly would not be paying attention. So that's not the place to sense the um, gospel while the epistle is reading. No, we pay attention to the word of God. That's the whole point of this part of the divine liturgy. So let's see it done right. End of the epistle reading. <laughs> Κατά την τάξη με ελχίσε δε Ειρήνηση το αναγίνω And now a whole bunch of hallelujahs, not just three. It's the real order. Senses, the great sense from the beautiful gate.
now let's see how the gospel is read uh, when you have three deacons, the proper order. Sophia, Orthia, Kusomen, to a year, is the second deacon. Because the first deacon is going to read the gospel. Let's, up, let's back up and see how the deacon is blessed to do the gospel. As you know, there's a dialogue between the uh, main celebrant and the deacon. And basically, the, uh, after the prayer of the uh, holy gospel, shine in our hearts, O Master, who loves humankind, which the main celebrant uh, prays, which is talking about uh, the, the gospel, then the deacon, it says on bended knee, but really in the old rubrics, the, the, the deacon would not be kneeling. Uh, this is a new practice. Uh, the deacon would say, bless master, the herald of the gospel of the holy, glorious apostle and evangelist, whoever it is. And then the main celebrant would bless the deacon. Um, in the old rubrics, it said with bended neck. In other words, the deacon would simply um, bow down a bit. He wouldn't be kneeling. But anyway, in, new in, in today's practice, oftentimes they kneel. May God through the intercessions, the main celebrant, May God, through the intercessions of the holy, glorious apostle and evangelist, so-and-so, grant you to proclaim the gospel, to do so with great power for the fulfillment of the gospel of his beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he's given the gospel, and the deacon re replies, Amen, 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 be it unto me according to your word. And there he is kneeling. on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. That's the, God, the, Spirit that's gave the dialogue them we just mentioned. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. And they were amazed and wondered, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it? that we hear each of us in his own native language. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt, view, because that's also a Libya call to attention Cyrene, for the gospel. And visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongue. is going to follow, he's going to play the role of the second deacon. Watch. <laughs> Wisdom arise, let us hear the Holy Gospel. Main celebrant always blesses, of course. And then the main deacon, the first deacon, is going to introduce let us be attentive, the third deacon. Even though he's really the second deacon, but this priest is acting as the second deacon, so he becomes the third. So after the readings, normally in the full liturgy, the way it's actually uh, supposed to be, there will be petitions after the Gospels. And remember, this is according to the ancient order of God speaks and then we speak back. So petitions originally followed 
the reading of the of the scripture and even the great litany that now has sort of like ended up in the very beginning of the service was originally in the time of Chrysostom and about the in around the fifth century also it was after the reading of the gospel along with the other petitions um eventually it ended up migrating to um right before the um uh, Thrusagion prayer before the Thrusagion and then by the um 10th or 11th century ended up be, being um, migrating to its present position so uh, a, there was a progressive migration towards the towards the beginning of the liturgy for some reason in any case uh the way the uh, petitions are now uh normally after the gospel there will be the fervent litany and then a litany for uh the catechumens and then two sets of litanies for the faithful and then that leads us that basically ends the um liturgy of the word as it were and then we begin the preparations for the great entrance and this leads us to the liturgy of the faithful so let's see how that starts the rubric hymn is being chanted and the prayer of the rubric hymn celebrate and then the sensing starts and the sensing is interesting because originally the deacon would do this sensing but then this uh, role was forgotten or it was assimilated or appropriated by the main celebrant as the great entrance became more and more magnificent because originally it was very simple so he's letting uh, the bishop the metropolitan of Sweden us do the sensing. Originally the deacon did it, but you see we have, again, the deacons are in this position where uh, the main deacon, the first deacon has the second deacon to his left, so when they end up outside, he's standing on the right half of the church, looking east, see? Let's go back to Athens and see what happens when we have three deacons and how the sensing is done. So the way it works is the first deacon will be having the third deacon is left and then to the left of that third deacon will be second deacon. Third deacon will be in the middle holding the cross and obviously the first deacon will be if you're looking from the back holding the trichary and to his left will be the middle deacon with the cross and then to that middle deacon's left second deacon with the decay. Okay. The third deacon holding the cross is the first deacon, second deacon, third deacon. See, first deacon with the decay, second deacon with the decay, the third deacon in the middle with the cross. They're always opposite the uh, main celebrant when the celebrant, well, the bishop, when the bishop is sensing around the old, all the old table, and then finally go out. Let's go back to Brookline and see what happens once once Cleopas finishes sensing outside, then he's going to sense inside um, the altar and all the bishops according to rank. Uh, they get three shots, remember? And then everyone will venerate the holy table and we'll see how that goes. And then that will lead us to the great entrance.
works is each bishop venerates the holy table individually. But then when it comes to the priests, it's going to be a priest and a deacon, priest and a deacon, priest and a deacon, depending on how many deacons there are. In other words, first priest, first deacon, second priest, second deacon, and always it's going to be the priest with the deacon to his right. Here we're going to have the last uh, bishop venerating, and then we'll see the priest and deacon. Deacon, venerating three times, making up three prostrations, kissing the Andimension, and then one more prostration, and then asking forgiveness from the people. Second priest, second deacon. Well, no, not enough deacons. They got a little confused here. Now we're going to see the same thing in Athens. Deacon behind. I'm going to ask him forgiveness. And then the second priest, the second deacon. Now there should be the third priest and the third deacon. Let's see what happens. Three prostrations. Then this leads us to the actual great entrance. Let's go back to Brookline. So we have the second deacon holding the and then the first deacon obviously is going to be holding the Viscario, and the first priest is going to be holding the chalice. And then other priests will be holding different things. Let's look at some diagrams to understand the order, how it works. In other words, the great entrance. Again, we have the mountain. The first deacon being the sort of centerpiece and everyone receding in front of him and everyone receding also by rank behind him. So the, here is not a hierarchical liturgy, but a normal liturgy uh, with a priest, as it were, um, and which means that all the clergy participate, whereas with a bishop, the bishop stays at the in the sanctuary. And this is hearkening back to the ancient earlier form. Again, we said that uh, hierarchical liturgy gets less wear and tear, and it's like that vintage Mercedes-Benz, the 1958 one in Bardos's garage. And basically, uh, it retains older forms where in the olden days, the, only the deacons would do the uh, entrance. And it would be a silent entrance. And in, eventually, um, after around the 10th or 11th century, you begin to have um, the uh, priests participating and you begin to have the, the uh, intonation of uh, pandonimon. May the Lord our God remember all of you in his kingdom, both now and ever into the ages of ages. In any case, we have here the, the, in a normal liturgy, as it were, with a presbyter, the deacon, the archdeacon, he's the tallest because he's, he's at the center and everyone recedes in front and back of him and in back of him. He's holding the discarion high up, okay? And behind him is the first priest with the chalice. And then all the other priests, they're holding something. Why? This is an, a memory of the fact that this used to actually be a real entrance from a separate building, from a different place. And the so-called skevophilakion, the so-called vestry, that was the vestry, where all the things 
the utensils, the holy utensils and the vestments and everything were stored. In fact, also the gifts, in other words, the people would bring their offerings, they would leave their bread, the best bread and the best wine and the proskomidi, the early proskomidi was done by the deacons and it was very simple. It was basically the um, choosing of the best bread and wine for the liturgy in the separate building. And then at the great entrance, those deacons would scoot out and go to that building and bring in the utensils and the bread and wine that was needed, that would be needed and to be used for the um, uh, liturgy of the faithful, right? Which obviously has the consecration and the Eucharistic prayer, the anaphora. And so what we have is the um, deacons originally would do it by themselves and the priest would be waiting or the bishop, the bishop slash priest, because the priest actually does used to do the role of the bishop. Um, so uh, hierarchical liturgy harkens back to their old form. So here we have the first deacon with the the discarion and the so we and the second deacon holding uh, sensing, and then maybe a third deacon holding a candle. Okay, first, second, third, first, second, third. How about if it's a hierarchical liturgy? Well, it could be this way: uh, deacon, archdeacon, in the uh, at, at the sort of peak, right, with the uh, discarion, and behind him again the um, uh, first presbyter, and then the other presbyters will all be holding something. Why? This is a memory. What does it? What does it mean to bring these these things in the cross, the spoons, the uh, long heat, You know, the the um, lance, as it were. All these things, taking them on a U turn. Well, it's a memory of the fact that there used to be. There used to be a practical reason for this. It used to be a real uh, entrance from a separate building where all these things would be brought in. Okay, so that's a liturgical memory of something that was actually practical, but now has become ritualized. Okay, but this is a hierarchical liturgy where we have, in this case, and there are different forms where first deacon and the second deacon is holding the trikeri and the censer, and the second third deacon is holding the the dikeri. And usually, in a hierarchical liturgy, you're going to have what? You're going to have um, a usually the second priest would be um, yes first priest third priest because the second priest ended up being sent up here in the front why because the um, second priest usually is the one who is assigned to holding the uh, small omophorion that he's going to give to the bishop why is that traipsed around in a procession well that was an old Byzantine um, custom, uh, the emperor actually would, uh, his clothing would be traipsed around or processed around, and that would be an indication of his presence. And so sort of by extension, the bishop would do this kind of thing. So it ended up getting um, incorporated into this entrance. So we have the first deacon with the discarion or the, the patent. And here we have the second deacon. So there's another way of doing it with a censer and the trikeri. And then the third deacon with a the vicary and a censer. Okay, so and 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 in front of them all, right behind the altar boys, would be the first, the second priest with the small omophorium, because he has to be in the front in front of everyone else in order to first give that back to the, the bishop. Oh, and it seems that this is usually what you see in the United States: the great entrance, hierarchical divine liturgy with five deacons. And this is a possibility of how to do it. You won't usually see something as complicated as this, but here we have the first deacon with the discarion, the and then the second deacon is holding the trikeri and the um, censer and sensing the um, first priest with the chalice, okay? And then we have the, th uh, th okay, first deacon, second deacon, third deacon, fourth deacon with a, with another three carry. In other words, the way it goes is the first deacon has a three carry. If you have four deacons, second deacon has the carry. Um, third deacon has three carry again, and then fourth deacon has the carry. Oh, actually, here we have five. Oh, yeah. But then here we, it's even more complicated because we have five, right? Since the first deacon is holding the, the uh, discarion, then the second deacon gets to hold the uh, three carry, and then the third deacon, the three carry, and then the fourth deacon, the three carry, and then the fifth deacon, the three carry. And in front of them all is the uh, priest with the um, omophorion. Now, let's see which of those versions. Um, ended up happening and in Brookline. 
of course, there were only two deacons. Yeah, altar boys. And the second priest with the small memorial. And the second everyone pauses and first the first deacon is going to um, commemorate the uh, archbishop may the lord our god remember your archpriesthood in his kingdom both now and ever and the ages of ages and then the archbishop takes the discarion and commemorates and then the first priest will do the same thing commemorating the archbishop again and then give it the chalice to the archbishop and he will commemorate the uh, dead and this is a memory of the fact that in the olden days again when we have a hierarchy liturgy old older forms uh, emerge you might say or appear again and uh of the fact that uh, the names that are now privatized in the proscomedy service you know they were actually uh, read publicly and that's also harkening back to the old diptychs that we're going to talk about oh, no. oh. Now the first priest doing his commemoration and he's going to give the chalice to the archbishop and then he commemorates the dead and look at this old icon of which is called the, the divine liturgy and it's really depicting the great entrance as symbolizing the whole divine liturgy even though this was as i said before a soft point in the liturgy just the changing of the guards kind of like an intermission in order to get the stuff ready for the for the next part of the liturgy so what we have is basically angels slash deacons because deacons as we said are icons of the angels so here they are they have deacon clothing uh, vestments but they have wings too and so and when they have this large what it looks like an epitaphius well the epitaphius is derived from the old air okay the air as you call it and it used to have a depiction of the dead christ on it and it was so big that it had to be a process in the same way that we process the Epitaphio in the Holy Friday Vespers, the Apocathilosis, the taking the uh, unnailing of Christ Vespers, where at the Apostica, we said at the end of that Vesper service, there's a special procession uh, where what was an old common habit of processing with this huge ayer, which later on became limited only to Holy Week and called the Epitaphios, but it used to be used throughout the year in liturgies not in vespers only but especially in the liturgy well here we have it the old form and we have basically a proof that the deacons were the ones who were doing the entrance because that was their job to bring things and transfer things and uh, do entrances and these kinds of things 
okay so we have um these deacons uh uh slash angels um and you needed a whole bunch of them because the ayer was so big now that it's smaller and more user friendly we just it's just simply put on the back of the deacon right and this icon is actually from um the 16th century and i believe it's from uh, crete also yes now let's go back to brookline and see how everyone enters back into the altar after the bishop is finished with his commemoration of the dead Covers are taken off. The Ayer, the more user friendly now, is taken off the back of the first ticket. Says the order of Matthew Despota, the Guru Master, and the end of the 50th song is recited. But as the bishop is ascension, or the main sober ascension, the covered gifts. And then this blessing is given to everyone, and let's look at the blessing. But before doing that, I'd like to look at a diagram of the chapel or, or of a normal church and uh, mention something. The great entrance, the Skevophilakio in that separate building would usually be around here. At least in Hagia Sophia, it was here. In other words, on the uh, sort of northeast uh, part of, uh, northeast of the, the main church. And the deacons would take the um, utensils and the bread and wine and whatever tools they needed to, to do the liturgy and go here. And then usually they would go either all the way around or there were many doors and they would probably go through a side door and then come in like that. So that was the early, and it would be only deacons and originally that nothing would be said. And eventually it sort of snowballed and got more and more complicated and accumulated more and more meaning and more magnificence as it were. So what I'd like to show you now is the dialogue that happens between the main celebrant and the deacon right after everyone enters back into the sanctuary after the uh, great entrance. And it's very interesting because it shows you exactly what we've been talking about throughout this week, that oftentimes uh, we superimpose rubrics over the actual intent of the original intent of uh, the, um, the, the texts. So here we have it. After the um, everyone enters, you know, here's the Pandonimon Mysticiris Otheos. May the Lord God remember all of you. Originally was you, Imon, with an Ypsilon, Pandon Imon. Why? Because originally, uh, as priests began to take over the great entrance, as they were entering, people would say please please pray for me and he would and the priest would say well may the lord god remember you in his kingdom and that eventually became ritualized and became a permanent feature and ended up being intoned in a very magnificent way so that's an example of a liturgical development uh, but after everyone enters um, there's a dialogue between the a main celebrant and the deacon and what we've done today is because of a uh, sort of hierarchical uh, mentality or hierarchical way of interpreting things, we like to say that the deacon has to be always sort of like under, but that's problematic because what we have here is the original uh, dialogue was as, follow, as follows, uh, priest, deacon, priest, deacon, or presbyter, deacon, presbyter, deacon, doesn't it make sense? So the original uh, way the dialogue um, occurred was as follows the presbyter would say remember me brother and co-celebrant because the deacon is a co-celebrant just like all the people and the lay people they're all co-celebrants -co okay but we tend to limit co-celebration to to clergy now and indeed not only clergy but uh, only the priests or the 
the bishop and the priest. So remember me, brother and co-celebrant, calling the deacon a brother and co-celebrant. And then the deacon says, may the Lord God remember your priesthood in his kingdom, both now and forever, and through the ages of ages. And then the, um, the presbyter says, pray for me, holy master. It makes sense because it, it's a dialogue. Uh, priest, deacon, priest, deacon. And then the deacon says, may the Holy Spirit come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And that makes sense because the deacon is an icon of the angels. And this is exactly what we read in Luke 135 when the uh, archangel Gabriel said to the Panagia, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. And what happened? Incarnation. And divine liturgy is, is an incarnation. And isn't the priest uh, leading the people in this process of an incarnation? In other words, the, the, the consecration of the Holy Communion, where we all become the body of Christ. But we have something going on that's very special between the walls of the church and especially in the sanctuary and that is basically an incarnation right because we believe in the real presence of the body and blood of christ in the communion and that we all become that so it makes sense that the deacon would be saying this uh and then the priest says may that spirit come celebrate with us all the days of our life okay in other words it makes sense that the deacon symbolizing the angel is saying this to, to the priest who is basically leading the people in this process of incarnation. But the way we do it today, because we didn't like the fact that the um, the presbyter was calling the deacon a master, despota, called the deacon a despota, uh, what we ended up doing is changing the order. Instead of priest, deacon, priest, deacon, priest, deacon, in order to avoid that, it would be priest, deacon, deacon, deacon. And that's what we do it now. And then the priest... So the priest says, may the Holy Spirit come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, which means basically this is a filioquist way of looking at the priesthood. In other words, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. The priest, sort of like, a, you know, an extension of the bishop representing, as it were, uh, or being an icon of Christ, the Holy Spirit coming, proceeding from Christ, which means and the Son, filioque, okay? In other words, you have Christ or the church as an institution already, and then as an institution, it spews out, as it were, the sacraments and, you know, like a drugstore, like a CVS. Uh, whereas the original idea was that you, the Holy Spirit is what uh, makes Christ, right? As we find in the Annunciation. So this is following, the original order was following the order of the Annunciation with the, the deacon in the place of the angel and um, uh, talking to the Panagia, which after this, we have Christ being incarnate. And this is exactly what the priest is doing. So in today's practice, it goes like this. Um, presbyter, deacon, uh, deacon, presbyter, deacon. And so the deacon says, may that spirit come so celebrate with us all the days of our life. And then at the end, it's, it, it ends up in, in, in the right order. Okay. So obviously, you're going to do it in the order the way it is today, but you just have to be aware of the fact that, um, and also they have the deacon and kneel, and in, in the rubrics it doesn't say this, okay? So in other words, uh, I want you to know some of the history behind all this, that there's a really beautiful, uh, venerable, you might say, uh, tradition go going on here. But at least here we don't have, um, too much kneeling, but just the blessing of all the heads of all the clergy by the. <laughs> Let's go back to Athens. 
see the same thing. refer to morning or evening because liturgy is outside time because in, in Vespers it would refer to the evening and in Orthodox it would re refer to the morning because this completion litany is seen in all these services and they would be towards the end of the services remember but then eventually other things were appended on like aposticha in both Orthodox and Vespers but why do we have a completion litany here well it turns out that this is probably a remnant of the last of the litanies that would have been done after the, the gospel. And those litanies that after, are between the gospel and the uh, liturgy of the faithful are basically serve as a bridge between that, the, the, the um, liturgy of the, of, the, of the word and the liturgy of the faithful. And the way the great entrance developed while deacons were bringing in the stuff silently, uh, sometimes to save time, uh, petitions were the petitions were, were being still being done and eventually this last set uh ended up getting in the books uh after um the actual entrance um you know because when we're doing things at the same time you can't put that in a book but it has to be put somewhere uh but in actual fact the books ended up uh you know putting this final uh, completion litany. So this completion litany was basically the end of the liturgy of the word and you know uh, the catechumens were being dismissed and uh, especially in at the petition for the catechumens but this is, is the last of the set of petitions and it ended up getting lodged here in the books and then it sort of got frozen there. <laughs> Following the completion litany, we have the kiss of peace and the creed. And so the kiss of peace originally was done by uh, all the people uh, according to rank. In other words, bishops and priests would do the kiss of peace and deacons amongst themselves would do the kiss of peace and all the lay people would do the kiss of peace amongst themselves. Um, so let's watch how this is done. And if the deacon was alone, he would actually, according to the rubrics, kiss his orarion, interestingly, interestingly enough. Otherwise, if there are two deacons, the, uh, other, the other deacon that would be um, in the altar would come out and do the kiss of peace with the deacon that was outside doing the petitions, finishing the completion litany. Oh. 
και ζώπιο σου πνεύματι ειν και αή και εις τους αιώνας των αιώνων. in other words, to make sure that none of the catechumens or any, anyone who's unbaptized is still remaining in the church, uh, is, or, this order is, is done by the, the deacon, the doors, the doors. And then the ayer is done like this, shaken over the head, And then the main part of the divine liturgy, the kernel of the divine liturgy, the anaphora, which has obviously the consecration of the holy gifts and the epiclesis uh, now begins how with the deacon the deacon introduces it because again the deacon is the mc the master of ceremonies and he begins by calling people to attention again stand let us stand right let us stand in awe let us be attentive that we may present the holy offering in peace and then what follows is a, a dialogue between the main celebrant and the people and this idea again of of uh, the work of the people that is a cooperation so this is how the anaphora, anaphora actually begins and the life of the world to come. Amen. Stormen kalos, Stormen kalos, the Stormen metaphor, let us stand right. Proskomen, in 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 the main celebrant faces the people because there's a dialogue between the people, because there's cooperation, the work of the people. That's what the anaphora is. The heart of the liturgy, the kernel of the liturgy, and we all are consecrating the gifts together, but the main celebrant is leading the people in this action. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. That's taken from 2 Corinthians 13 14. Let us 
lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord. So it begins by glorifying and thanking God. so-called Epinikion Hymnon, the triumphal hymn, which is based on Isaiah 6.3, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of the glory, but also combined with Psalm 117, 25, and 26. follows immediately afterwards is the are the so-called words of institution in other words quoting directly from scripture uh from the last supper from the mystical supper He gives my body which is broken for you for the remission of sins, quoting directly from the gospel. And for the Roman Catholics, these words of institution are extremely important. And this is the magic moment, as it were. Whereas for us, the most important moment is the epiclesis, the calling down of the Holy Spirit. And, he, and the deacon would show. You see, the deacons are pointing to the pattern when he says, Take eat, and to the chalice when he says, Drink of this, all of you, this is my blood for your covenant. And then there's the consecratory prayer. The actual epiclesis follows immediately. But this normally is the job of the deacon. So the deacon normally would be doing this. Of course, there are different practices, but originally this was the job of the deacon, holding the uh, paten or the scarion uh, with the right hand, giving a sort of precedence of the bread, okay? Body and blood, bread and wine, because Christ first broke the bread and gave it, distributed it, it to the disciples and then the wine. So uh, remember, right is right. So the right hand always. And in early rubrics, it wouldn't be so high. It would be slightly lifted. Consecratory prayer. Consecratory prayer. Where there could be um, dialogue with the people, and the people have to say their amen. Or at least the people in the altar and deacons should say that amen. 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 After the consecration, the last part of the anaphora are the so-called diptychs, which uh, are remnants. It's a remnant of the old public commemoration of names, and it starts with the Panagia, uh, and starts actually after. First of all, Christ is incarnate, consecrated, and then immediately afterwards, uh, the Panagia follows, and um, various saints, and it all ends up with the uh, commemoration of the bishop as we're going to see 
And then finally, the deacon mentions, and remember those whom each of us has in mind and all the people. In other words, everyone else. So it's this idea of all the people. says names. So this, again, is also a remnant of the diptychs. In other words, saying publicly in the context of the divine liturgy and not in the context of a, pri of a privatized service like the First Comedy, which developed later uh, in its present form after the 9th century and into the uh, 10th and 11th century, uh, basically taking its modern form after the 14th century. In any case, the deacon would be in the back of the altar um, and saying names of dead and alive, alive and dead, as he, he senses lightly, as you see here. And then the commemorations. So the commemoration of the bishop, if it was a normal liturgy with just um, priests and not a hierarchical liturgy, uh, what the rule is, is always a priest, wherever that priest is in every any region of the world, if he has permission to be liturgizing, he has to uh, commemorate the local bishop. And in the Holy Trinity, there's only one father, there's only one head, you can't have two heads. So what we see in some earlier books in the North Express, of course, from California, is uh, a two-headed monster. So in the olden days, in the, in the era of Yaakovos, he wanted wherever uh, some, wherever a liturgy was being celebrated, for the local bishop and the archbishop to be um, commemorated, but that's theologically not sound. So wherever you are, there is a first. In other words, there is a local bishop, and that local bishop is the one that's always going to be commemorated. So that's the way, that's the rule for a priest. But for a bishop, wherever that bishop is in the world, it's not connected with geography, but wherever that bishop would celebrate in the world, he would commemorate his superior, okay? And so in this case, in, in Brookline at Holy Cross, what we have is, um, since we're under the patriarchate, uh, all of the metropolitans actually commemorate the patriarch. That's the structure of the, the Holy Synod, the way it is. It's kind of strange, but that's the way it is now. And so El Pilaforos, the archbishop, and all real metropolitans are in America are actually commemorating the patriarch. However, any assistant bishops or titular bishops uh, you know, assistance to L.P. the Forest, they have to commemorate their superior, and their superior is L.P. the Forest. So you're going to see how what we have here is each um, bishop is commemorating individually whoever their superior is, whether the patriarch or L.P. the Forest. If all of them were under, let's say, uh, L.P. the Forest, then they would all do it together. And then afterwards, but because if there's a variety, they have to do it individually. And then afterwards, we find that the priests will, will all be commemorating LP the Forest together. Okay, so that's the way this is done. So let's see how, let's watch this. Son, 
So the first bishop after Apidophoros on this day is this assistant bishop. Normally he wouldn't be because he's an assistant bishop rather than a metropolitan, but he was ordained. So on the day that you're ordained, you are the first. But he's not the first because Apidophoros is the f because he's an assistant bishop. So this Athenagoras, who used to be is the, was a chaplain of uh, Holy Cross, uh, he was ordained on this day, and so he's in the first place. He's to the right of. Um, in other words, he, technically he's in the second place, so he's uh, right after uh, Archbishop Elpidophoros. So Elpidophoros is, is, in a sense, representing the patriarch, and he um, is the first after Elpidophoros, um, referring to Elpidophoros himself because he's an assistant. <laughs> And then next is going to be Methodius, the Metropolitan of Boston, and he's going to commemorate the patriarch. And it keeps on going. And, and whoever is a real Metropolitan commemorates the patriarch, but whoever is an assistant will uh, commemorate a uh, titular bishop, would commemorate uh, after the forums. And now, after the last of the bishops, and who, who is um, um, Bishop um, Joaquim Kotsonis, who is the librarian at the school, and he's an assistant bishop, he's going to commemorate, obviously, Elpidophoros. After him, we're going to see all the priests together commemorating Elpidophoros because he is the first bishop. Um, he is their first bishop, their local bishop. Uh, and by the way, uh, sometimes another bishop might have permission to celebrate. If, if, in other words, the school, let's say, belongs to Elpi the Forest, but if someone, if another bishop is celebrating, obviously he has permission, when he's celebrating, he's going to be commemorated by the priest because he's the president of that Eucharistic assembly. So whoever is the president of the Eucharistic assembly will be commemorated by the priests because they are able to assist in the liturgy by virtue of the fact that they are given that permission from their local bishop. Among the first, remember, O Lord, our Archbishop of Pithophoros, grant unto him your holy churches in peace, safety, honor, health, under length of days, and rightly teaching the word of your truth. Now we went together, all the priests together, referring to El Pithophoros. And this emphasizes the centrality, in other words, the unity around the uh, local bishop, which is hearkening back to the synthronon and the old uh, version of the liturgy where it would be uh, one episcopal centric. And, and this is the end of the diptychs where everyone is remembered. And then the Anaphora ends with the Ekphonesis um, and the mercies of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ be with all of you. In ke ai ke istu se onas ne ono. Then is a blessing. This is the end of the anaphora. Then we enter into the pre-communion rites. And basically, what happens is a deacon, the deacon does this special uh, petition, which is acknowledging all the saints that have been commemorated, and also acknowledging the. Uh, consecration of the gifts, right? Having commemorated all the saints and also for the precious gifts here presented and consecrated.
And now to save time, what follows is the Lord's Prayer and then the fraction. So let's see this. And then after the Lord's Prayer and some petitions, we have the proschomen. Uh, let us be attentive. Obviously, that's a, an exclamation of the deacon, an order of the, de the deacon. And then the priest or the main celebrant, the bishop, um, uh, refers to the holy gifts for the holy people of God. So the holy people of God are the congregants, the people who are in the church. The Amnos, the Lamb, is lifted slightly, and then what follows is the fraction. And what you have in the fraction is the bread being divided into four pieces. Why four pieces? The first goes in to the chalice, and the reason for this is this is opening back to the old Episcopal centric liturgy where parishes uh, that were led by priests that were around that uh, Episcopal centric cathedral. Uh, the bishop would actually give a piece of bread to acolytes who would run to the different um, uh, parishes and the priest would mix with his consecrated gifts, the gifts consecrated by the bishop. And that would be a tangible sign of unity around the bishop again. Then we have the communion. And the way bishops commune is um, the body and blood together, but the way the priests commune, the bishop is going to commune them, each will take of the bread separately, the body, go around and then go and take and then the deacons would follow and then they would they then the priest would follow and um take of the chalice and then the deacons Athenagoras communion, communing the priests and the deacons. First deacon. 
second deacon. And then, to the left of the bishop, everyone receives of the chalice in the same order. And then the deacon cleans up. And on the video on the pre-sanctified, I showed you how to do this. But here we have the first deacon doing it. And if there's more than one chalice, you're gonna either dip one of the pieces of the unknown into the main one and then put it into the other one or you pour a little bit in. So he's pouring. the call to communion. And in the olden days, the deacon would keep the chalice, and that's why he holds the chalice, but now because the, the priest would give um, parcels of the body directly into the hands of the lay people, just like the clergy would receive. Uh, the deacons would be holding the chalices, but now, now that this has been forgotten. of the source and of the os from Laos que abode from the Eurymiasu and it's erupted and then it's followed by Rise, having partaken of the divine of Miona, holy and then the final petition immortal heavenly life creating and awesome mysteries of the Christ of thanksgiving. let us worthily give thanks Thanking to the Lord Lord have mercy help us save us and mercy on us and protect us while this is being done by your grace and dimension is spoken perfect, holy, peaceful, and sinless day, let us commend ourselves and one another and our whole life to Christ our God. And then the dismissal. In the case of a hierarchical liturgy, everyone goes out. Why? Because it's kind of like in the same way that there was a processional into the church, uh, what you have with everyone going out being right left right left right left uh with the bishop in the middle it's kind of like the same structure of that synthronon but the whole apparatus is kind of like leaving the church now Amen. 
Let's see how they do the final dismissal, in other words, the monastic dismissal that came about around the 13th century or from the 10th to the 13th century in Athens. <laughs> God bless you. It's been a pleasure to be with you. And tomorrow we'll have our live session and whatever questions uh, arise from this um, video, we can address. So thank you very much. <laughs>